so hello everyone and welcome to our ninth inspiration exchange session uh, my name is nick maxfield i'll be moderating today's session and i handle the van der Schaar labs communications i'm also joined by mihaila van der Schaar and a number of members of our lab who will be presenting our projects and also taking part in a participative discussion in the latter half of this session so to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session as always, our ongoing aim with Inspiration Exchange is to share and explore the breadth of topics in machine learning for healthcare and to generate ideas for future research projects. In our previous session, we had the first of two deep dives on the topic of individualized treatment effect inference or ITE inference, which is obviously a key research area for our lab at the intersection of machine learning and healthcare. This time we'll be building on that session and honing our focus a little bit um, by looking at the time series setting for ITE inference. And Mihaila will give a quick introduction of that in just a minute. But to break this down for you time-wise, um, after my introduction, Mihaila will say a few words on today's topic. And then we will show a few presentations by our lab members uh, laying the groundwork for our participative discussion. And this participative discussion will be in the latter half of the session, as I mentioned, um, on ITE inference in the time series session. And what we'll do is, in a kind of break from how we used to do these sessions, um, instead of asking you to put your questions for us into the Slack channel, um, we'll actually just ask you to raise your hand on Zoom. Uh, this is how we did it last time, and we got a lot of good feedback on this, so we're going to continue with this format going forward. And then after just about an hour, I'll wrap up with some closing words. But before we get started, I just wanted to introduce a couple resources that we have on the topic of ITE inference. Some of you may already be uh, familiar with these to some extent. Um, the first such resource is a kind of written primer or an overview um, that serves as an introduction to ITE inference as a research area. And it talks about the importance of ITE inference, some theory, some of the challenges and some potential healthcare applications and highlights some key projects by our lab so far. If you want to find this, you just go on our website and it's under research pillars and then you click ITE inference. The second uh, resource that I'd like to introduce is a series of video tutorials we recently produced on the topic of ITE inference. Um, there are six such tutorials or courses, and these cover a range of topics such as fundamentals, theory, various algorithms and applications, and more advanced topics. And we built these for a range of different needs and users. At present, we have about uh, 20 videos or modules and are adding more as time goes on. And this is a collaborative project at this point featuring eight of our lab's members. And if you want to find the video tutorial series, basically all you need to do is just go on our YouTube channel here, or you can go on our website and click tutorials. Um, at this point, I'd like to hand over briefly to Mihaila um, for just a couple of words on the topic of ITE inference in the time series, if that's okay with you, Mihaila. Yes, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. I'm really very happy that we have these sessions to discuss among ourselves how really we can advance these topics in machine learning for healthcare. And while Individualized treatment effect estimation and causal effect inference is, of course, a very important area. Um, I would say that in terms of applications, treatment effects over time and personalized therapeutics in a time series setting is one of the most powerful and most complex of the applications that we can consider. Often clinicians don't make decisions about giving a treatment just once, but they make subsequent decisions for patients that may be either chronically uh, sick or may have a variety of side effects potentially, or uh, may need to monitor and decide subsequent treatments and interventions over time. So determining when to intervene, how to intervene, how often to intervene, when to change treatments, or whether to wait before uh, doing any intervention. These are all decisions that are involved in um, determining treatment effects over time. This also represents an important um, frontier in machine learning because a lot of assumptions and a lot of challenges are involved in making such methodology work. Our lab has done quite some work in the last uh, few years in this area, and you will see a few of the different projects. 
but I feel that we are very much at the beginning of this area. So towards the end of the discussion today, I'd like to open it up and bring some of my own thoughts and my own questions to you. And I'd like to brainstorm together with you as to how we can go as a community further in this research agenda. So thank you very much for joining us. And I really hope you'll be participating a lot in the discussion after we hear a few um, projects from our lab. Had to take myself off mute there. Um, thank you very much, Mihaila. And um, so now it's time for our presentations from our lab members. As I mentioned, we have four of these and I expect them to take about 35 minutes in total. Um, one of them will also be given live, but the rest are pre-recorded. So um, first up, we have Zhao Ji Chen, um, who will be giving a presentation on Sig Twin. Hello, welcome to the short presentation of Sig Twin, treatment effect estimation with longitudinal EHR data. I'm the presenter, Zhao Zhiqian. In this presentation, I will introduce and formulate the problem of estimating the causal individual treatment effect in the longitudinal setting from observational data such as EHR. In this problem setting, we consider the longitudinal outcome with point treatment as illustrated in the figure on the right. Here, for, each, for all the individuals in the data set, we observe the treatment allocation at a given point in time and the treatment allocation will divide the timeline into the pre-treatment period and the post-treatment period. And the post-treatment period is, uh, is illustrated by the uh, gray, gray area in this figure. We observe the outcomes both before and after treatment. And we also observe the temporal covariance that leads to the treatment decision. Just as all the observational studies, the treatment allocation is subject to the confounding bias and we will use the te those temporal covariates to adjust for the confounding bias. A requirement for such an estimation method is that the method should be interpretable and trustworthy. We'll expand on those, those notions uh, in a short time. The longitudinal treatment effect estimation has very, uh, is very significant and has many uh, clinical applications. As we all know, uh, many clinical trials are underrepresentative for the general population because of the small sample size and uh, eligibility criteria. Moreover, the real world uh, electronic health records data contains a lot more uh, samples, which makes subgroup identification and the measuring the heterogeneity within uh, subgroups possible. And this can lead to personalized treatment decision and the precision medicine. Last but not least, the observational data set contains longer uh, outcomes, both positive ones and adverse ones. Uh, however, the clinical trials are often uh, done in a shorter time span and is inadequate to um, fully measure the long-term outcomes. Before diving into the method, I wish to explain uh, the notion of explainability and trustworthiness. There are different notions of interpretability. Uh, here we adopt the notion of uh, interpretable by examples. This means that uh, for the estimation of any target individual should be explainable by a small set of contributors. And the algorithm can also measure the weight, uh, measure the contribution of each contributor. Here as an illustration, uh, we look at the figure on the right. Um, we want to estimate for one target individual, what can, what can we do to explain the estimation? Well, we can explain it by finding uh, a few contributors that are really similar to the target individual and uh, uh, that drives the algorithm's de de decision. And in fact, we can present those contributors and their contribution to the clinician and uh, uh, the clinicians can then validate whether those contributors are really um, close to the target individual by their domain knowledge. In terms of trustworthiness, um, this property is also highly desirable, especially when we use this the algorithm to make personalized treatment decisions. For that application, we need to identify the individuals whose ITE cannot be reliably estimated, which is unfortunately always possible because the presence of outliers. 
Uh, a trustworthy method should warn the clinician not to trust the estimate and fall back to their domain knowledge and use their judgment. Now the think twin method inc includes three steps, encode, synthesize, and estimate. For any target individual, we find the a few, very few contributors from the opposite treatment group. Uh, and uh, the first encoding step will use uh, the temporal covariance to uh, we encode the temporal covariance into fixed representation vectors using deep neural network. In the second step, we'll build certain contribution ways based on uh, the representation vectors. And those ways are clearly measuring the contribution of the contributors and therefore making the method more interpretable. Based on the same, same set of ways, the algorithm um, estimates the counterfactual outcomes by performing the weighted average on the selected contributors. And such a counterfactual outcome can be computed both before and after treatment. And we can use the difference between the estimated and uh, um, the real outcome before treatment to measure the trustworthiness. We performed extensive simulation study to illustrate that the synthetic twin consistently outperforms the baselines on a variety of scenarios. We also bring the method to the real data and uh, attempt to replicate the a clinical trial with observational data. And here we took a, a large scale clinical trial called Heart, Heart Protection Study, which enrolled more than 10,000 patients and lasted for more than one year. And we use an uh, electronic health uh, data set called CPRD in the UK, which roughly covers 10% of the UK population. And after applying SyncTwin on the CPRD data set, uh, we managed to replicate the finding of the clinical trial. This gives us evidence that SyncTwin is applic applicable in many real world uh, complex data sets. If you're interested in knowing more, please check out the longer tutorial and also visit our website. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have a sort of double header of short presentations by Joanna Beaker, the first of which is um, Counterfactual Recurrent Network. Hi, my name is Joanna Beaker and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford and the Alan Turing Institute. In this tutorial, I'll talk about machine learning methods for causal inference, and in particular on how to estimate individualized treatment effects over time using patient observational data. Now, to first illustrate the need for being able to estimate counterfactual outcomes, consider the case of deciding treatment plans for cancer patients. We want to learn from patient observational data, such as electronic health records, which contain diagnostic information about the patient, as well as original information, such as lab test results and treatments administered over time. In this context, we want to build causal inference methods, which, given a history of patient observations, can then forecast what would happen to the patient if we assign to them a particular treatment or sequence of treatments in the future. And by estimating these counterfactual outcomes for each patient, we can then make more complex treatment decisions by determining which treatment plan leads to the best patient outcome, which in this case is the smallest tumor volume. So these causal estimates of treatment effects over time can be used to determine when is the optimal time to treat a patient, when to stop a treatment plan, and which sequence of treatments to use. Since we want to leverage on original patient observational data from electronic health records, I will first describe in more detail the structure of such data to so set out our problem formalism. So for each patient, we observe static patient features B, such as diagnostic information. Moreover, at each time step, we observe time-dependent features X and time-dependent treatment A. And here we consider that at each time step, each patient can be assigned one of K possible treatments. And all of these form the patient history H. And in addition, in the observational data, we also have the factual outcome Y of the patient for the treatment AT given a time step T. So we work in the Neyman Rubin potential outcomes framework, which was extended by Robbins and Herdan to account for time varying treatments. So using observational data, our aim is to estimate all potential outcomes Y, both factual and counterfactual, under an intended sequence of future treatments from time step T to time step T plus tau minus one, Condition on the patient history at time step T. So to be able to identify these potential outcomes from the observational data, 
we make the sequential overlap assumption and the sequential stroke ignorability assumption. Now, estimating counterfactual patient outcomes over time is challenging due to the presence of time-dependent confounders in observational data sets. Time-dependent confounders are patient covariates that affect the treatment assignments and are themselves affected by past treatments. So current methods for handling the time-dependent confounding bias are based on marginal structure models and use inverse probability of treatment weighting. In particular, such methods learn the propensity weight of assigning treatments conditioned on the patient history and use these propensity weights to weight the loss function for training the predictive models for estimating counterfactual outcomes. And through inverse probability of treatment weighting, these methods create a pseudo population where the treatment probability no longer depends on the patient covariates. In this pseudo population, the counterfactual estimates are unbiased. So using inverse probability of treatment weighting may result in high variance estimates due to extreme weights and is also numerically unstable when the treatment probabilities are very small. So in our work, we introduce a counterfactual recurrent network model and we propose instead building treatment invariant representations that can break the association between patient history and treatment assignments. So each time step T, we build the representation of the patient history that is invariant to, to the assigned treatment. And using this representation, we can then obtain unbiased estimates of the counterfactual outcomes. Our model, the counterfactual recurrent network, is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model capable of estimating for each patient potential outcomes for intended sequences of future treatments, conditioned on the patient history. And to handle the bias from time dependent confounders, we build each time the balancing representation of the patient history through domain adversarial training. And I'll now go through each component of the model. The idea of using adversarial training for building the treatment invariant representations comes from domain adaptation, where several works have measured the disparity between distributions based on their separability by a discretely trained classifier. So taking inspiration from works in domain adaptation, we consider the symmetric hypothesis class H as consisting of the set of symmetric multi-class classifiers, such as neural network architectures. And the H divergence between all pairs of two distributions is defined in terms of the capacity of the hypothesis class H to discriminate between examples from the multiple distributions. So empirically, minimizing the H divergence involves building a representation where examples from the multiple domains are as indistinguishable as possible. And we use this idea to obtain an adversarial framework that involves building a representation which achieves maximum error on a domain classifier and minimum error on an outcome predictor. Now, in our case, we train a treatment classifier using the cross entropy loss to predict the treatment given a time step t based on the patient representation, and we also train a predictor network using mean squared error to estimate the outcome given the patient history and the treatment AT given a time step t. Now, to build treatment invariant representations and to also estimate patient outcomes, we aim to maximize the treatment loss and minimize the outcome loss, which gives us the following overall loss of time step t, where the hyperparameter lambda controls this trade-off between domain discrimination and outcome prediction. And we use standard, the standard procedure for training domain adversarial networks, and we start off with initial value for lambda, and we use an exponentially increasing schedule during training. And to train such model using um, backpropagation, we use a gradient reversal layer, which flips the gradient before a treatment classifier, such that we maximize the treatment loss. Now, the encounter network part of the counterfactual recurrent network uses a recurrent neural network with LSTM unit to process the history of treatments, covariates, and baseline features to build the treatment invariant representations through domain adversarial training. The decoder network uses the balanced representation constructed by the encoder to initialize the state of the recurrent neural network. So the decoder network continues to update the representation while estimating outcomes under an intended sequence of future treatments. Now, in real data sets, counterfactual outcomes and the degree of time independent confounding are not known. So to validate the counterfactual recurrent network, we evaluate it on a pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic model of tumor growth which uses a state-of-the-art biomathematical model to simulate the combined effects of chemotherapy and radiotherapy in lung cancer patients. And this model of tumor growth allows us to simulate patient outcomes under different treatment plans. And such ground truth information is needed to be able to evaluate the model's ability to forecast counterfactual trajectories. Moreover, this simulation setup also allows us to vary the degree of time-dependent confounding and subsequently evaluate the robustness of the causal inference methods to increase degrees of time-dependent confounding bias. And in particular, time varying compounding is introduced by modeling the treatment assignments as Bernoulli random variables that depend on the history of the tumor diameter. And the parameters gamma c and gamma r control the degree of time dependent confounding bias. 
because the higher the gamma, the more bias there is. We evaluate performance in one step ahead and multi-step ahead prediction of counterfactual outcomes under different degrees of time-dependent confounding bias. As evaluation metric, we use a root mean squared error between the model's forecasting of counterfactual outcomes and the ground truth outcomes obtained from the data simulation. And we observe significant performance gains for multi-step ahead prediction and for high degrees of time-dependent confounding bias. And in the lower figure, to evaluate whether the counterfactual recurrent network has indeed learned pre and invariant representations, for gamma equals 5, we illustrate a Disney embedding of the balanced representation phi built by the encoder for test patients. And we color each point by the treatment received at time step t to highlight the invariance of the representation across the different treatments. However, evaluating these causal inference methods just in terms of root mean squared error is not enough for assessing their reliability when used as part of decision support systems. So in addition, we also evaluate these methods in how well they can choose the correct treatment and timing of treatment. To conclude, despite its wide applicability, the problem of causal inference for time-dependent treatments has been relatively less studied compared to the problem of causal inference in a static setting. And even though estimating the effects of treatments over time is more challenging, it also gives us unique opportunities in terms of understanding how diseases evolve under different treatment plans and how individual patients respond to medication over time. However, direct estimation of counterfactual outcomes from observational data, such as electronic health records, is hampered by the presence of time-dependent confounders. And these time-dependent confounders are patient covariates that affect the treatment assignments and are themselves affected by past treatments. And in this tutorial, I have introduced a few methods of handling this time-dependent confounding bias and describe in more details the counterfactual recurrent network, which is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model that builds treatment invariant representation to handle the bias from time-dependent confounders and to reliably estimate counterfactual outcomes. The reference for the papers can be found here and on the next slide. And moreover, the code for the counterfactual recurrent network is publicly available, as well as the code for the clairvoyance package, which contains multiple of these causal inference methods, so I encourage you to try them out. Thank you for listening. Okay, so now we're, now we're getting into the latter half of our presentations. Uh, we have two more to go. Uh, this one's from Joanna Beaker as well on Time Series Deconfounder. Hi, my name is Joanna Bika and I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford and the Alan Turing Institute. In this tutorial, I will present our work on the Time Series Deconfounder, a method that can be used for estimating treatment effects over time in the presence of hidden confounders. The aim of this work is to be able to obtain unbiased estimates of the causal effects of treatments over time, and we consider in particular the setting when multiple different treatments can be assigned at each time step. In this figure, we consider as an example estimating treatment effects for patients with cancer. These patients are often prescribed multiple treatments at the same time, which may include chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and immunotherapy. The assignment of these treatments at each time step it depends on the patient covariates, in this case tumor volume on potential side effects such as hematotoxicity, and how these patient covariates have evolved over time. And the treatments are given with the aim of decreasing the tumor volume in this case. However, we, we notice that the combination of treatments assigned to the patient changed the time step 3 due to the increased side effects caused by the previous treatments. Now, given such observational data about patients, which can be found in their electronic health records, we want to be able to estimate individualized treatment effects. So conditional on the patient history of covariates and treatments, we want to estimate the patient outcomes, which in this case can be survival probability under different combinations of treatments that are part of a future treatment plan. And all of the existing methods for estimating individualized treatment effects over time assume that there are no hidden confounders in the data. This means that we observe all of the patient covariates that are affecting the treatment assignment and the patient outcomes. However, as we will see, this assumption is not testable in practice. Moreover, the presence of hidden confounders introduces bias when estimating treatment effects over time. So for example, consider that while the side effects are also affecting the patient's survival probability and the changes in the treatment assignments, they are not recorded in the observational data for the patient. So if we use an observational data set that only has information about tumor volume, and the treatment assignments, this will lead to biased estimates of the patient outcomes because these outcomes crucially depend on the side effects which are not in the data. In terms of problem formalism, we assume that we have access to an observational data set and for each patient, we observe time-dependent covariates and time-dependent treatments. 
At each time step, there can be key different treatments that can be simultaneously assigned to the patient, and this is very important for our setting. Moreover, we also observe the patient outcome YT plus 1 given the history of covariance and treatment. We work in the potential outcomes framework introduced by Neymar and Rubin and expanded by Romis and Hernan to account for time-varying treatments. And we want to be able to estimate all potential outcomes, both factual and counterfactual, under an intended treatment plan that starts at time step t, condition on the patient history until time step t. Now, to be able to learn these potential outcomes from the observational data, we make the standard assumption of sequential overlap, which means that each time step, each patient has a non-zero probability of receiving each treatment. And very important, this assumption can be tested in practice. Now, all existing methods for estimating individualized treatment effects over time also assume that there are no hidden confounders. This assumption can be written in terms of the following condition independence relationship, which states that the potential outcomes for any treatment plan starting at time step t are conditionally independent on the treatment assignment at time step t given the patient history. This assumption is not testable in practice since it requires the conditional independence of the treatment with all of the potential outcomes, both factual and counterfactuals. However, since the counterfactuals are never observed, it is not possible to test for this conditional independence. And if this assumption doesn't hold, then we will obtain biased estimates of the treatment effects. In this paper, we introduce the time series decomponder, which is a method that enables the unbiased estimation of treatment effects over time in the presence of hidden confounders by taking advantage of the way multiple treatments are assigned over time. So the time series decomponder relies on building a factor model over time to obtain a sequence of latent variables that can act as substitutes for the hidden confounders. Then these latent variables can be used to augment existing observational data sets and thus lead to unbiased estimates of the treatment effects. The first step of the time series decompounder is to build a factor model that can capture the distribution of the causes over time. In this factor model at each time step t, the latent variable zt is built as a function of the patient history, such that, together with the patient covariance xt, it renders the assigned treatments conditionally independent. This enables us to build a factor model of the assigned causes that has a joint distribution as written on this slide, where theta are the parameters in the model. The factor model construction takes advantage of the dependencies between the multiple treatment assignments over time to build a latent variable zt. Through this construction, we can rule out the existence of other multi-cost confounders which are not captured by zt. Now, to understand why this is the case, consider the graphical model in the figure on the right. By contradiction, assume that there exists another multi-cost confounder, bt, not captured by zt. If this is the case, by this separation, the condition independence between the assigned causes given zt and xt cannot hold anymore. So because of this, we can rule out the existence of other multi-cost confounders that are not captured by z. However, this argument cannot be used for single-cost confounders, such as lt, which are only affecting one of the causes and the potential outcomes. Because of this, we assume that there are no hidden single-cost confounders, and this assumption means that we observe all patient covariates that might affect the assignment of only one of the treatments. This assumption becomes um, increasingly weaker as the number of treatments increases each time step, and the more because the more causes we observe, the less likely it becomes for a hidden confounder to affect only one of them. We can then prove that the potential outcomes for any treatment plan starting at time step t are conditionally independent of the treatment's time step t, given the history of treatments, observed patient covariates, and inferred substitutes for the hidden compounders. And this essentially gives us sequencer strong ignorability. After fitting the factor model, we can use it to sample the sequence of latent variables from Z1 to Zt and incorporate them in the observational data about the patients. Then the time series decompounder fits an outcome model to estimate individualized treatment effects over time. So using the theory developed for the factor model over time, we introduce a practical implementation based on a recurrent neural network with multitask outputs and variational dropout as illustrated in this figure. So we build Z as a function of the patient history, process through a recurrent neural network, then use multitask heads with fully connected layers to model each treatment assignment as conditionally independent given the latent variable Z and the patient covariance X. To model the probabilistic nature of the factor models, we incorporate variational dropout in the recurrent neural network as illustrated in this figure. To validate the theory for a time series decompounder, we perform experiments on synthetic data where we vary the effect of hidden confounding. 
It is not possible to validate the method on real data sets since the true extent of hidden confounding is never known. Now, to keep the simulation process general, we propose building a data set with p order autoregressive processes. At each time step t, we simulate k time varying covariates xtk, representing single cost confounders, and a multi quotient confounder zt, as described in the following equations. The value of zt changes over time and is also affected by past treatments. We use the time series t confounder together with two different outcome models, recurrent marginal structural networks and marginal structural models. So the way this works is that we first train the factor model to infer the substitutes for the hidden confounders, and then we use these substitutes to augment the observational data set and then use this data set to fit the outcome models. We control the degree of hidden confounding through the parameters gamma a and gamma y, which we set to be the same in this experiment, and we vary them from 0, which means no hidden confounding, to 0 0.8, which indicates a high degree of hidden confounding. Now in this figure, the red lines show the results for training the outcome models with the generated observational data, which has hidden confounders. On the other hand, the purple lines show the results when also incorporating in the observational data set the simulated, which are the oracle hidden confounders. The remaining lines show the result when applying the time series confounder we notice that our method gives unbiased estimates of the treatment responses that are close to the op estimates obtained using the simulated oracle con And finally, we also perform an experiment on real data using the MIMIC database from which we extract a data set with patients that receive the combination of the following three treatment options at each time step, antibiotics, fast suppressors, and mechanical ventilator. And for each patient, we extracted 25 patient covariates consisting of lab test results and vital signs measured over time. In this experiment, the aim was to evaluate the effect of treatment on the following patient covariates, white blood cell count, blood pressure, and oxygen saturation. And hidden confounding is present in this data set, as patient comorbidities and several lab tests were not included. However, since it, this is a real data set, it is not possible to evaluate the extent of hidden confounding or to estimate the true oracle treatment responses. In this table here, we report the root mean squared error when estimating treatment responses by using marginal structure models and recurrent marginal structure networks outcome models directly on the extracted data set, which is confounded, and after applying the time series deconfounder and augmenting the data set with the substitutes for the hidden confounders of different dimensionalities dz. So in this talk, we introduce a time series deconfounder, which is a method that takes advantage of the patient of the patterns in the multiple treatment assignments over time to infer latent variables that can be used as substitutes for the hidden confounders. And through experimental results on both synthetic and real data sets, we show the effectiveness of the time series deconfounder in removing the bias from the estimation of treatment responses over time in the presence of multi-cost hidden confounders. As the reference, to the, the reference to the paper can be found here, and additional references can be found on the next slide. Moreover, the code for a time series deconfounder is publicly available, so I encourage you to try it out. And thank you for listening. Okay, so our fourth and final presentation is from Alexis Bello on a recent paper um, that he will be uh, presenting live. So Alexis, if you want to just go ahead and share your screen over mine. Thank you, that's perfect. And then, um, yeah, just get started whenever you like. Um, yes. I'm trying to make it full screen, but I have the um, the Zoom uh, on top of. Um, ah, let me do it this way. Yeah, you can you can unshare and then okay, you you worked it out. Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, good. So my, my name is Alexis and I will talk about um, a, a new method that extends a family of methods for synthetic controls to processes evolving uh, continuously in time, as opposed to discreetly in time. But I, I will talk about all of this uh, in a second. So to start off, uh, synthetic controls, interestingly enough, is um, one of those methods that are much more um, widely applied in practice than they are uh, theoretically analyzed in fields such as uh, statistics or uh, computer science. So for instance, uh, many, many, many do say that it is arguably one of the most important innovations in policy evaluation literature in the last 15 years. And um, perhaps, perhaps the reason is that it is a very intuitive method and 
simple to simple to apply, simple to understand, and um, and it is very widely used in especially to analyze public policy intervention, but also recently in healthcare. So Jaoji is a project that we we heard about um, a couple of uh, presentations before is uh, one example of a synthetic control method being uh, developed and applied in, in healthcare. So to fix ideas. Um, um, synthetic controls are, are about a causality, understanding the effect of interventions. And as we will use the word, it is understood in terms of uh, what would have happened if things had been otherwise, which is a counterfactual account of causality. Um, there are, of, co of course, uh, others, but in, in machine learning, it is one of the most common ways to frame causality, and synthetic controls uh, work in this uh, setting. So perhaps um, it'd be easiest to start with, uh, with, an, with an example. And one of the most famous ones uh, is about uh, Proposition 99 in California, which was a comprehensive anti-tobacco legislation package uh, that was implemented there. And uh, years after, we, we would like to understand, was it really effective on the basis of data that we have? So one of the first things uh, you might do, as in many other empirical studies, is compare California to other uh, similar states that will act as uh, controls to estimate what would have happened in California had this uh, legislation package uh, not been passed. And in this setting, synthetic controls really give you a very nice and intuitive way to choose in the first place which uh, states in the United States are make a good comparison and how to combine them to, uh, to have an unbiased inference of the counterfactual path of uh, California had the legislation not been passed. And so uh, more specifically, actually, what, um, what we're interested in, in doing in, in this project, what the original authors did, was um, uh, they, they tracked the per capita consumption of, uh, of cigarettes um, over a, a number of years. And um, as, as you can see, when, when this legislation was implemented in 1988, we were already on a downward path in, in cigarette sales and the rest of the United States was as well. So uh, the question to, to say it again is really whether this legislation had any effect in lowering further the sale of cigarettes or if, um, if uh, this uh, downward trend would have happened anyway. And synthetic controls do something very interesting. Very, very interesting. They choose um, a number of control states to approximate the uh, before intervention trajectory of California. And the interpretation is that if you're able to do this well, then whatever happens after the, um, the legislation is implemented, the counterfactual trajectory, then uh, represent what would have happened in California had the legislation not been passed. And um, as you can see on this figure, the difference between the solid line, which is what actually happens, and the dotted line, which is uh, the synthetic control for California, is what we will call the uh, treating effect. Now, um, I will introduce a, a very a little bit of notation to be able to contrast which uh, what we will do in continuous time. But this really formalizes what we uh, what we have uh, talked about uh, just now. So in the Typical setting, a synthetic controls consider a, a number of uh, units. So here you can think of uh, states, countries, uh, individuals, uh, patients in healthcare. And um, in a typical setting, each one will be observed on uh, the same set of time points. So here uh, you, you will see this is a, a first limitation that will that will try to um, to extend. But um, but that's how synthetic synthetic controls work uh, to start with. And uh, by convention, we will consider only one of those units being applied to the treatment, or one of uh, your patients being uh, given a specific drug. And this will happen at some uh, time uh, t. So whatever happens before this time t is um, your trajectory without treatment, and then whatever happens after time t is the trajectory with the treatment. And then in uh, the counterfactual setting, we typically uh, distinguish between two potential worlds. So one uh, where the treatment has been applied and one when the treatment hasn't been applied. And the treatment effect is simply a contrast between these two worlds. Only one of them, of course, is, is observing practice. And uh, well, synthetic controls, uh, what they do is they, 
they take a fairly straightforward linear combination of, uh, of controlled states. So uh, observe here that the, the unit of interest or the patient of interest, which is, uh, which is the first one, is, is not included in, in this combination, of course. And so yeah, this uh, simple linear combination is uh, what is commonly called the synthetic control. And uh, you will optimize for these weights using uh, your, your data and then uh, compute the treatment effect as a difference between what has been observed and what is estimated. And now working in uh, continuous time, what, what, what do I mean by continuous time? I, I hope it will be clear from here. Let me just start by saying first that uh, one of your objectives is to relax the assumption that um, all units, all patients are observed on the same set of uh, time points. And uh, this will, this might be the case in uh, certain public policy interventions where all data is observed on a yearly basis, but it will certainly not be the case for patient data, where um, each uh, individual has observations made whenever they, they make an appointment at the hospital and not uh, between appointments or at any other time. We, we keep the setting where only one uh, patient is uh, intervened on and the rest is uh, treated as a control. And now the important part is that rather than uh, considering combinations of, uh, of patient observation to, to build your synthetic control, what we will do is um, consider combinations of uh, infinitesimal variation in this trajectory, in this patient trajectory as a synthetic control, as uh, your estimate of synthetic variation in uh, the counterfactual trajectory of your patient of interest. So the conceptual difference here is that instead of looking at uh, observations and combinations of observations, we look at variation and combination of variation uh, to work in a, uh, in a continuous time setting using differential equations. And also a further difference is that instead of, um, of forcing all of our combinations to be linear, we allow them to be more general. So uh, your function f here uh, may include nonlinear combinations that for certain heterogeneous patients may, uh, may do a better job of approximating your counterfactual trajectory. So I, I guess the intuition is easiest by looking at this uh, control differential equation. And uh, to actually get the path of uh, the patient or the, the counterfactual trajectory, you just integrate both sides, obtaining uh, the expression we have at this uh, fourth uh, bullet point, which is what we will call the continuous time synthetic control. That is really, so like I said, analogous to the discrete time version, just uh, with this um, different interpretation using variations instead of the actual observation. And then, um, as in um, other synthetic control methods, the treatment effect is simply the difference between what we observe and what we what we estimate. So to um, to give maybe more graphical um, description of uh, what we've just said, uh, we'd be working in a setting that looks a little bit like the figure that you see. So we assume that. Uh, our, uh, our different patients or our different state countries have observations done irregularly in time. And um, like in many processes, it's also important to note that even though discreetly observed with observations, of course, um, it is often assumed that the underlying process is uh, evolving continuously in time. It's not because you don't observe something that it doesn't change and still exists um, in, in time. So, so perhaps if uh, you want another argument for looking in for modeling things in continuous time is that for many processes, they do evolve in, in continuous time in reality, even if we only observe them at the discrete time points. So what's interesting uh, in, in this figure is uh, the contrast between discrete time and continuous time approach. So if you were to use, um, if you were to use uh, classical synthetic controls, you would uh, perhaps interpolate the data and coerce it to be seen at the exact same time point and then use your combinations for the counterfactual. In our sense, we, we really approximate the, the path and then have nonlinear combination of control states, of control uh, individuals or patients, and have those estimate uh, paths in the counterfactual path in continuous time. So this is the uh, rightmost uh, figure, which is um, our interpretation of synthetic control. Um, then I have a, 
two slides to conclude, which are uh, two uh, experiments, two example data sets uh, that we use to um, illustrate this method. So um, to start with, we, we went back to the original uh, tobacco legislation study that, um, that has been uh, analyzed many times, and we gave our version of this uh, continuous and synthetic controls. So um, as I've said before here, the, the, the problem is to make, estimate the counterfactual trajectory of uh, California after 1988, which is when the legislation uh, was passed. And on uh, these figures, the blue curve is our method, neural controlled, uh, neural continuous time synthetic control. And all the other uh, curves, except for the dotted line, which is uh, the observed path, all the other curves are other versions of the synthetic controls, all in discrete time that have been developed uh, since the first uh, since the first uh, proposals. And um, well, in this curve, um, I I guess the synthetic the original synthetic controls uh, fit the data so well to start with that uh, it is just a confirmation that all methods um, perform well in practice, hours included, and which which you can see by the fit that we give prior to 1988 um, on the data. So for this example, linear combinations seem to work very well, which is something we knew already. But uh, we attempted to, to, um, to investigate more complex data sets. And one, uh, one that we found was on uh, a public policy estimation again, which tries to analyze the impact of Eurozone membership on uh, on Spain's uh, current account balance. So whether or not uh, Eurozone membership was um, uh, was de detrimental for um, for um, for the current account balance of uh, of Spain because of all the regulation involved in the Eurozone. And in in this case, we we took a pool of um, of other similar countries not from the Eurozone and then use different synthetic control methods to try to combine this control state to approximate um, our, the Spanish trajectory before the introduction to the Eurozone and then analyze uh, what, what happens um, afterwards, what is uh, our estimate of uh, the counterfactual trajectory afterwards. And um, in, in this case here, we, we have the similar, similar uh, color code for, for all, all methods. So uh, the continuous time synthetic control is, is shown in blue. And here you can see that because of the heterogeneity of, um, of you know, country trajectory, a nonlinear method like ours much more closely uh, approximates the uh, pretreatment trajectory. And in a sense, should give us more confidence that whatever we estimate afterwards is uh, closer to what would have been expected uh, without uh, Eurozone membership for, for Spain. So it so happens that in this case, the interpretation is uh, fairly similar. So um, all methods really estimate that uh, current account balance would have remained uh, fairly flat without Eurozone membership. But, um, um, but yeah, at least uh, pre-treatment, uh, our, our method seems to provide a benefit. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alexis. Um, so now it's time for our participative discussion. We do have relatively limited time, but we're going to try and um, see how far we get in it anyway. Um, and we may extend this session just a few minutes. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, as I mentioned, there's a few topics um, that Mihail has chosen for her and the lab members initially to discuss. And then we really want to kick it to the rest of you in the audience and have you join in the discussion, add your points and questions, any anything you disagree on, any opinions you have. Um, so you can do this by raising your hand in the Zoom chat and, um, and lowering your hand when we finished with your particular point. Um, so uh, Mihaila, if you want to go ahead and, and kick things off with the first of our topics. Yes, so thank you very much. I wanted to ask the following question uh, and I'm going to put on the spot, they don't know that this question comes towards them, to Iwana and Georgie. And I wanted to ask them, what do you think, why is IT over time a lot more complicated than the static setting? And do you think that there are unique challenges there? And do you think that the current literature, inclusively your own work, addresses all these challenges or are some of them missed? 
So maybe Iwana and Shaoji, you can give your opinion first and maybe we can discuss. Uh, sure. So I think there are two main reasons why IT inference over time might be more complex than the static setting. So the first one is the fact that the confounders are no longer static. So we have time dependent confounders and observational data sets. And these are the patient covariates that are affected by past treatments, but themselves influence future treatments. And when building IT methods for estimating treatment effects, we need to take into account the bias from these time dependent confounders. And a second reason I think is also the fact that in the static setting, we are usually interested in estimating the effect of a single treatment uh, on the patient outcome. But in the temporal setting, we are also interested in estimating the effect of a sequence of treatments. So that will require like modeling um, how this sequence of treatments affect the patient outcomes. Now, in terms of like whether current methods address all of these challenges, I think that for a time dependent confounding bias, the current methods use inverse probability of treatment weighting or like balancing representations. But I think future work could be done uh, on this topic to like build even better representations. And also, I think that it would be interesting to also look at treatments with dosage or like having multiple treatment combinations over time because current methods cannot properly address this yet. Iwana, what about um... Um, we often are looking at just one outcome, but we know that treatments, and especially treatments over time, may have side effects, which may manifest themselves at different moments in time. What do you think about that particular challenge of looking at multiple outcomes, potentially side effects, potentially competing risks? And how do you think, do you think that this is a unique challenge? And what do you think about yes, that? Yes, I think that's very interesting. So currently, like, yeah, we model one single outcome, but current methods may be extended to have multiple outcomes. But in this case, we might look at building different types of balancing representation for each outcome because um, the patient covariates may affect differently the side effects or, for instance, like the tumor volume, how that changes. And I think it will be important to carefully consider how we balance the patient covariates when estimating these two different outcomes. Thank you. Xiaoji, any, any other further things or anyone else who is online would like to contribute to the discussion of whether we have new challenges in the time series setting for treatment effects? If you want, we can go to, oh, I think uh, Peter's actually got his hand up. Um, so yeah, Peter, please go ahead. Hi there. Um, so uh, just a couple of points. One on um, the time series decompounder. Uh, de um, so I'm just trying to understand how you're actually, uh, your, your, your sort of model for learning the hidden compounders. And if I understand it correctly, you said that you use the pattern of multiple treatment assignments um, as the basis to learn these compounders. So do, is the, the logic behind that that, for example, if you have hidden multimorbidities, uh, then you might have multiple treatments and therefore you can infer that someone is more likely to have multimorbidities if they're receiving multiple treatments. Is that the idea behind it? So the idea is that the hidden confounders will introduce dependencies in the way these multiple treatments are assigned over time. So for instance, uh, the side effects, like the patient, the, treat the treatment that the patient will receive will change, for instance, if the side effects are increasing. So by noticing those dependencies in the way these multiple treatment assignments are changing, then we can infer latent variables that can act as substitutes for the hidden confounders. That is the idea of like building the factor model to uh, capture these uh, dependencies in the multiple causes over time. Okay. I think and I'm... if you allow me to bring the discussion back to, to my challenge to you all, inclusively you, Peter, and everyone else, do you, does anybody else have any other thoughts on how to deal really with challenges in this time series setting? Do you feel the current methods do it enough? Do you think there are other things we as a community should be looking at. We do have another hand up. It's from Josh as well. Um, if I don't know if it's 
related to the questioning you just asked Mihaila, but Josh, do you want to go ahead, I guess? Yeah, so this is related to the, the kind of the discussion before, but I guess it's more from a practical sense rather than a theoretical sense. So I wondered whether in experience the the recommendations of the kind of tr the tr treatment trajectories and stuff like that, how do they align to kind of what's possible in terms of costs or like resources and, and whether we whether it's whether it's worth considering taking those into account and how how that might be done. Great. So Josh, this is so Alexis, Siwana, Georgi, can you say something, Yarun? Can any of you say something about how your methods take costs into account? And so this is this is basically what you suggested, Mihaela, is um, multiple outcomes need to be taken into account when predicting this thing. Like current methods, they predict an outcome like tumor size, for example, but they don't predict or they don't take into account when composing a treatment plan, how much chemotherapy will cost or how inconvenient it will be for the patient or what side effects chemotherapy could cause for a patient. Like that's, that's currently not taken into account to my knowledge, but it's a very interesting research direction, I think. Alexis, anything to add? Um, it, it's very interesting, but um, I, uh, Yeroun is is right. At least in uh, so from from what I read, uh, very very little is done um, incorporating costs in all these machine learning uh, models. So also from a data perspective, I have never seen that information included um, with uh, patient biomarkers, for instance. So uh, there may also be there may also be a limitation on, on that side, like this data that we really have available to construct models. Okay, Nick, maybe in view of time, we can go to one more question. Sounds good. Um, should I just make it the second of the, the of your selected questions? Okay, let me get that one loaded up. There we have it. Um, My second question is again for a few of you um, and this for the entire community. How can we deal with the assumptions of overlap and hidden confounding in the time series setting? And of course, you wanna talk a little bit about uh, one potential solution with time series deconfounders. But I was wondering whether you as a community, what do you think about this assumption? So um, Yeroen, maybe can I start with you? And then maybe I allow Iwana and Alexis and anybody else in the audience if they have any thoughts. Sure, yeah. So hidden confounding is, is somewhat addressed by, by Iwana's um, time series you can find. But I think overlap is, is maybe a, a stricter assumption in the time series in that once, for example, once you start a treatment plan and chemotherapy, maybe it's harder to switch to radiotherapy once you've, had a few shots of chemotherapy, right? So I don't think, I think over overlap is harder to assume in the time series than in, in a static setting, but that's, I have no idea whether this is actually true, but it's, this is an intuition I have, like that, that overlap in time series is, is more difficult. And I'm not sure how to deal with it um, when it's violated. Iwana, Alexis, Georgi. I mean, I guess one important distinction is the fact that overlap is testable. So that is something yeah. we can test in the observational data that we have. And also we can look at using methods that assess for which type of patients maybe there is less overlap such that we make sure that when we use the um, causal inference model in the test, the test time, we don't like issue predictions for those patients that we don't observe overlap in the training data. But I think this can be like the problem of overlap in the temporal setting can be addressed by methods like synthetic control because there, for instance, if there is only one single treatment plan that is given to the patient from one time point onwards, then we can use uh, the methods that Georgie and Alexis have presented uh, to estimate the counterfactual for the other treatment plans. Alexis, Georgie. Yes, so hidden confounder is it's really tricky because on the basis of data alone, you, you can never rule it out. So in my opinion, the way to go would be to look for sensitivity, sensitivity analysis and uh, confidence interval type methods to really understand how sensitive your method is to violations of, uh, of this assumption. 
because um, often um, rather than the point estimate, it's an overall conclusion that you're looking for, either harm or benefit with a given treatment. And if those conclusions still hold uh, on your dog threat as violations of your assumptions, then, then I guess that's a valid inference of uh, your model. Okay, so anybody else, uh, any other outside our group, any other thoughts about assumptions that you think we should be making or as a community? And potentially we could make some additional assumptions that may make sense in practice and that may lead to better, if you like, results or any inductive biases that we can encode in this problem to lead to better results. maybe food for thought for us as a community. So Nick, maybe you can show another question that I prepared yep. for. Um, I'll show you three of five. Give me a second to share this one. Okay, there you go. So the next question that I prepared was, uh, and again, this is a, really a question for everyone here. What do you think is the role of missingness, missing data, inclusively informative missingness in this treatment effects over time? So we do not have often information and observations at all the different time points. And especially in the discrete time setting, this plays an important role. So the question is both how we can cope with that, but also can we capitalize on informative missingness uh, in the treatment effects over time estimation setting? What do you all think? Would any one like to? try to think about it. I don't think there are clear answers, so. So maybe maybe I can I can give us. So if, if the missingness is random, then this is, I think, not a, um, not a different problem than, than usual imputation could solve. If it's informative missingness, then maybe we should think about hidden confounders again, and that there is some unobserved thing causing uh, missingness. So maybe older people, um, doctors don't measure their length or something like that that could be that could be a thing that we should take into account and maybe maybe try to learn or maybe infer a hidden confounder from this missingness could be an interesting um, way of thinking maybe um, i do think we have a hand raised at the moment um so do you want to go ahead jana majaya yes 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 uh, I just wanted to add, uh, can uh, time series reconstruction be also a potential solution where you have multivariate time series? And uh, when you have some data missing from, initial data missing from one of the series, time series reconstruction, would that be a possible potential solution? Yes, indeed. I, I was thinking, I think your point you are raising is interesting. So can we even maybe, often people do missing data imputation over time uh, in order to be able to issue better predictions and in the treatment effect setting, the same could be done. But one wonders whether, a little bit like Erun alluded to and you are alluding to, can we really use the fact that a treatment was given to better impute information about either hidden confounders or just about missing data could, could be used to impute better past information, which may help us with future predictions. So okay. again, maybe what would be interesting is, can we do better missing data imputation um, in a setting in which we have treatment effects and we have treatments and treatments over time? either to infer hidden confounders or just to improve the quality of the imputation. I think that that's an interesting aspect to think about. Alexis, Iwana, anybody else? I mean, I think really yeah. this topic would be to consider irregularly sampled time series uh, and building models for estimating treatment effects over time that can handle this irregularly sampled data. So like, Alexis has done that in the synthetic control setup, but for instance, when we have like multiple treatment assignments over time, and when we want to estimate the potential outcomes for a sequence of features in the treatments, like the current methods mainly handle the discrete 
uh, time series setting. But if we allow for irregular time series setting and building models that can handle continuous time, that could um, like that could uh, take into account the missingness of the observations over time as well. Yep. I think uh, Peter has his hand up. Uh, Peter, do you want to go ahead? Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this uh, question of missingness that I think it, it might be dependent on the application as well. So if you're just wanting to predict treatment effect in a clinical setting, perhaps you don't really care so much what your, say, hidden confounders are if you're going to treat missingness as a confounder. You just want to maximize, uh, maximize the predictive accuracy, say. But if you're wanting to inform clinical trial design, for example, using an algorithm like this, then it might be quite useful to have some interpretability of uh, what's what's driving the the hidden confounder. Thank you for that, Peter. Actually, this brings me to a next question that Nick hopefully can show about interpretability. So I have also brought that up. So, so Nick, maybe we can go to the next question on interpretability, if you don't mind. Sure. Um... There we go. <laughs> yeah. so, so this was actually my, my last question. I'm going to skip a question. So it was indeed, how can we really do interpretability of treatments effects over time? So we often in the presentations that you have seen, we come up with models, but we need to provide these predictions uh, as decision support for clinicians and patients. So the issue of interpretability is, I think, very important. And Peter brought to this discussion further that maybe not only clinicians and patients, but also trial designers or, or other people that may want to understand this estimation over time. So the question again to all of you is, how can we better explain the predictions and recommendations made? One, one way is, of course, Alexis is synthetic control. Like that's one that's one type of interpretability. I guess you have more, but I think I think I think Alexis, you mean um, Zhaozi's uh, treatment. Uh, or Zhaozi's also, yeah, absolutely. So by similar patients, by showing yeah. similar patients that have had similar predictions. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other as a community? I think. Iwana, Alexis, Xiaoji, or anybody else. How do you think we can make these models more interpretable and more actionable in this time series setting? I think Peter can answer his question, maybe. Well, I, I, I think this actually follows on from what Harone was saying last month is, uh, Perhaps if we think about latent variables, how we integrate them into a generative model. And if we try and have some sort of informative model of what the latent variable is trying to capture. So for example, uh, in the, the generative models that I, I typically develop, you, you have a variable for the hidden stage, which is a potential confounder where someone is along their disease trajectory. Um, so that could be a potential approach. Okay, so wonderful. I think everybody is a little tired on a Friday afternoon. So, so Nick, maybe we can wrap up, wrap up. Thank you all Absolutely. very much for, for joining us and for all the discussion. Yep, and um, I'll just sort of blitz through this very, very quickly. But just before we go, um, just to let you know, we're planning our next session, which is probably going to be in early July. That's when we got it penciled in for at least. Uh, the topic is still... Um, to be determined, we have a couple of ideas. We'll let you more we'll let you know more in uh, subsequent days. And in the meantime, do uh, take a look at the content that we do have on ITE inference, um, the write up and the video tutorial series I shared earlier. And if you do want to stay up to date with these sessions, you can visit our website. Uh, we have a dedicated page for Inspiration Exchange where all the latest info will be shared, as well as, of course, via email and even via our Slack group. Um, if you do know any friends or colleagues who might be interested, please let them know about these sessions. And other than that, thank you all very much for joining. Thank you for your questions and comments and opinions. 
Thanks very much uh, to our lab members who joined and um, made presentations today and, and were here for the participative discussion. Um, and so I guess, uh, yeah, very much looking forward to our next session. In the meantime, please take care, uh, stay safe and see you next time. Thank you.